as he is uh, typically playing control decks. He's a player from the Chicago area playing against Joshua Cho, who obviously does have a Pro Tour top eight in Barcelona at Pro Tour. Um, I believe it was Dark Ascension. As we jump into this game, Bug at Delver. You got a Vendillion click tapped here for Cho. Looks like it's attacking. He's got a couple of lands in play, among them a Polluted Delta. Bernat has a couple of lands. He's going to play a Stoneforge Mystic. And Josh Cho, really one of the good guys of the community. Pretty universally loved. Or at least loved by me. I love Josh Cho. Yeah. I do. How can you not? Yeah, exactly. Batter Skull going to get searched up here by Stoneforge Mystic. Cho off to a nice start to this tournament. 7-2. and two. Bernat, 7-1-1 seven, one, one with his blue-white stone blade deck. Not sure exactly what he's playing in the standard portion, but I do know that he loves a control deck. Someone I played against many a PTQ back during my college days. Yeah, and Joe's another player. Who, uh, Josh, rather, is another player who's, you know, amount of that he was playing Magic sort of declined a few years ago, but he's been on an upswing in tournament attendance recently. So Joe's going to look at a brainstorm. He's also got a breath that can hang out in his hand as well, trying to figure out how he wants to kind of progress this game as he is already up a game in this particular matchup. And it looks like he's in a favorable position. It looks like maybe Bernat has stumbled on Lance a little bit. Uh, but Cho has a lot of cards in his graveyard. This figure obviously took care of something. He's resolved a Brainstorm and a Ponder. His Delver was killed via Source of Plowshares, but it looks like he may be in the driver's seat here. Yeah, Spell Pierce and Brainstorm plus a Shuffle effect. Probably a reasonable spot for Josh to be in. Rupp to K going to take care of the Stone Forge Mystic. Batter Skull is going to get stranded in Bernat's hand and attack there from Vendillion Click. We'll put Bernat down to 14, and Cho will pass the turn back over to the Blue White Stone Forge player who is going to cast the Swords of Plowshares to get that click off the table. And Michael doing it right now in his main phase with the two mana left over, showing an appropriate amount of respect for Spell Pierce. And there's Stone Forge Mystic yet again. And this is the issue that Tempo decks have against Stoneblade in my mind. Once their initial offense is blunted, usually just doesn't have a lot left over. It has some cantrips and some soft counter spells, but you really need to be applying pressure to maximize those cards. Mm -hmm. And once the Stoneforge Mystic deck starts making its land drops and doing its thing, it's really hard to catch back up. Muzawa's GTA will be the choice here for Bernat, so he does have the Batter Skull and the Kamigawa equipment in his hand. We'll see what Choi wants to do on his turn. Again, he does have that Brainstorm. He could fire that off in the end step. He's holding a Death Right Shaman as well, but he's got some options here. He's definitely got some nice cards in his hand too. I'm interested to see if he wants to take a draw here before Brainstorming. Yeah, me too. And it looks like the answer is yes. So he will draw a card. Not quite sure what it is. And he's going to slide it up. It looks like a copy of Abrupt Decay again. The last time we saw him just cast up to he's also got a Hypnotoric. Boy, his hand is really good. Yeah, and that's actually why I really like Josh's patience with this Brainstorm here. Since he has a Shuffle effect, why not just wait until you have something bad to get out of your hand? Yeah. A lot of people just cast their Brainstorms in this kind of spot. I like holding off when your hand's good enough where you're not in a big rush to cast it. Some say that the best Brainstorm is the one that is not cast, as Burnett has drawn a Flooded Strand for the turn. So land number four looks like it's finally here. As far as Burnett's deck list is concerned, a lot of basics over here. Six islands, three planes. He's only got two tundras and a whole bunch of fetch lands. Looking for maybe back to basics in his deck list. He has two of those in his sideboard. Creature Suite, he does have three Snapcaster Mages, four Stoneforge Mystics, and three copy of the Boogeyman, that is Trune Nemesis, and then a whole bunch of spells. He's going to consult his graveyard very quickly here. And back to basics is, uh, of course, very similar to Blood Moon in a lot of respects, and it fulfills the same role in Legacy of really punishing non-basic land-heavy strategies like Josh's Bug Delver deck. There is a Flooded Strand. Bernat's going to sacrifice that. See what land he wants to search up here as he does go down to 11. Again, wouldn't be surprised if it's a basic, as he is very basic-heavy on this particular weekend. Yeah, and he has Back to Basics in hand, so it wouldn't surprise me if he's trying to play the game in that spot. I think that there's a good chance that Michael, again, respects the possibility of Spell Pierce in Josh Cho's hand. He may even test Spell with something like Jace the Mind Sculptor to try to set Josh into a place where uh, he's able to resolve Back to Basics. He just says, I'm going to trade my Supreme Virgin for your death, right, Shaman? Let's get that thing off the table. And Cho going to draw a card here. It's a copy of Verdant Catacombs. So now there's a Brainstorm, there's a hymn, there's that Spell Pierce that we did mention. Doesn't seem like a bad time to fire for him. Well, I think that Josh wants to lead this off with the Brainstorm now that he's actually drawn a card in Verdant Catacombs that he doesn't want anymore. 
two and three forcible among the cards that are drawn looks like he drew a couple of lands with that brainstorm as well so you see him move the verdant catacombs over to the back looks like he may want to place those on top but he'll take his time with this brainstorm as every brainstorm player does yeah which is neither you or i <laughs> brainstorm is lame as <laughs> here is am to torak so burnett's gonna lose two cards and we'll find out what two they're gonna be as he does have looks like five cards over there maybe six jeez Six cards in his hand. Two. Well, he hasn't been making his land drop, so got to be something in there. Yeah. Let's see which <laughs> two leave. A verdict and a batter skull. Those are good hits. Well, every card in, in Michael's hand is likely to be a good hit. Yeah. Still got the GT, still has the, still has the back to basics. Cho will just pass the turn back. Forcible spell pierce and X in his hand. Burnett draws the swords. And you see he's really trying to play around spell pierce right now. Yeah. Like I said, showing an appropriate amount of respect. And he really wants to just land this back to basics. I, I think he's just trying to navigate the game into that place. And he's under no pressure right now. He has no rush to do anything. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Josh's draws are, are likely to get worse over the course of the game as, as his draws are, by and large, lower impact than Michael's. Michael also has a, a Snapcaster Mage and a Source of Postures in his hand, so he has no lack of action in the event that Josh does draw something powerful. And he can try to, again, navigate the game into a place where he's able to land back to basics after Josh has cast something of significance and lock out a lot of his mana. I like the patience here from Bernat of just passing the turn back. As you mentioned, he did have plenty of things to do, but he's showing Spell Pierce the appropriate respect and saying, I can play around this accordingly if I need to. So Cho will sacrifice that Polluted Delta, go down to 24, take a draw. It's a Misty Rainforest. Cho is the one light on action now. He's just going to play the Misty Rainforest and pass the turn back with the ability to hard cast a Force of Will now. I think Michael might be contemplating testing the waters here with a Snapcaster Mage on his Brainstorm. Mm -hmm. well, he's going to take a look at the graveyard. Will Josh does see a Brainstorm down there. Without a, shuffle in fact, without a shuffle effect in play, this is a fairly innocuous Brainstorm here. If Josh doesn't want to... You know, if he doesn't want to spell pierce this, that's fine. Michael gets to look at extra cards. If he does spell pierce it, that's the card that Michael was playing around this whole time that he gets to trade with in a fairly innocuous fashion. So there is Brainstorm. Joe says that's fine, which is always scary when a Brainstorm resolves. Especially when you have to imagine that your opponent is light on lands, and that's their bottleneck right now. You know, he's got a lot of action. You see an island there, among other cards. Source of postures as well. Burnett's got a really, really nice hand. And that basic island, crucial in all of this. Mm -hmm. Wants his land drops. And at this point, I think it's safe to safe to assume that he's he's successfully sniffed out that spell pierce is definitely going on. So we're not going to resolve this brainstorm. Again, a Chicago area player. You do see the Indianapolis Colts jersey. He grew up around that area, actually went to the same college as me, went to Purdue. Mm -hmm. And we've played in a many, many a PTQ. He's also, uh, when, uh, when Owen Turtwell was coming up, this is a guy that uh, really helped Owen get a lot better over the course of his career. Same can be said about AJ Soccer as well. So kind of an old school guy, but a very, very capable magic player. You oftentimes will see him in the top eight of tournaments with high Titan legacy. Okay. He's going to play the island here. Going to start by attacking with Snappy. Going to put Cho down to 22. Most players I, I associate with being successful high tide players play nothing but high tide because yep. the deck is so hard to play. Now here is the back to basics with two mana available and a whole bunch of cards in hand. This is sort of curious timing for this back to basics as Cho has none of his lands currently locked down and this back to basics would just trade with an Abrupt Decay for no additional value. But Cho has already played a couple of his Abrupt Decays and again, Michael is just trying to sequence his hand in such a way that he's playing around Spell Pierce. So I'm not a huge fan of landing it here, but if his major motivation right now is just try to minimize the amount of damage that Spell Pierce is causing, he sort of just has to cast his spells as the opportunities present themselves. It also kind of just feels like the ultimate test spell is just, you know, you have to have an answer to this or you're in a whole lot of trouble. There is Spell Pierce. So Bernat says, I'll pay. And that thing is in there. Cho's going to sacrifice Misty Rainforest. He's going to go down to 21, search out a land from his deck. Of course, by playing the Bug Delver deck, you're without basics. 
Yeah. Now, you may ask the question, why did Josh spell Pierce that when he had Force of Will in hand? The issue is that if, if Cho actually taps out for Force of Will in that spot and Michael has some sort of counter, the game ends on the spot. Yeah. Cho is just dead. By spell piercing there, he gets to see a, he may get to bleed a spell out of Michael, and he also gets to tap down Michael's Tundra as back to base is, is, is symmetrical. Yeah. So while that play looks a little curious on the surface, uh, it does make sense. Looks like Cho may have drawn a Death Ride Shaman. Again, he does have a Force Will, and then just to land in his hand, so not great stuff. Of course, the Bug Delver deck wants to get off to a pretty fast start, but his fast start was slowed down pretty quickly as Source of Plosters took care of in Dealing Click and Delver of Secrets this game. And now the biggest concern is Josh has to really debate before casting any spell because every spell essentially causes him to lose the land for the duration of the game or until he can find Abrupt Decay. And again, there's not that many Abrupt Decays left in his deck. Decisions, decisions. Shows a force of will. He doesn't want to cast. He doesn't want to cast that. He wants to cast a death right shaman. Yeah. You see, Bernat's writing down force right now. <laughs> well, I'm not going to forget about that one. As Michael Bernat will untap his four lands. That tundra, of course, will stay tapped due to back to basics. And Bernat will take a draw. Chase the mind sculptor. Looks like it was added. We know about the GT in his hand. Might just fire up another copy of Source of Plowshares here, too. Again, because, because Bernat was missing his land drops early in the game, his hand is just completely loaded. Yeah. He does know about Force of Will now, so he may have, you know, in that spot he may have just been saying, all right, I'm going to tap out for Jace this turn, but now knowing that Josh has Force of Will and could easily have a blue card in hand, he wants to wait and sort of bleed out Josh's resources before starting to try to land a real haymaker. Swords does take care of death, right? Bernard reaching towards his mana yet again. Maybe another spell to play here. He's going to start by attacking with Snapcaster Mage. Cho going to go down to, I believe, 20. Josh would just to land here. See, Bernard picked up a detention sphere. Here's a brainstorm. Good place to start. Three cards coming. Two coming back momentarily. With the player on the right resolving the brainstorm, he is in the driver's seat right now. And if you're in Josh's seat right now, that, that brainstorm, you have to imagine, spells your doom. Whatever Michael was trying to set up here, he now gets a, he's going to be able to set it up almost certainly. Yeah. So Bernat will put two cards back. He did have a fetch line on those cards. You see the polluted delta in his hand. It looks like he's ready to play that to make it a perfect brainstorm. But Bernat can feel that he is pretty far ahead in this game. He doesn't want it to slip away. He's going to sacrifice Polluted Delta. Lose a life. Likely search out a basic land. There's an island. Yeah, just trying to be cautious here. Yep. Pretty commanding seat. Josh with only two cards in hand. He knows one of them's Force of Will. Even if the other card in his hand was, say, Abrupt Decay to kill the Bat to Basics, uh, Michael would still have a lot of resources to work with, and, and Cho would be very light on things that mattered. There's a Jitay, the equipping the attack. Snapcaster will come across for two. Two counters on the Jitay. Cho's going to go down to 18. All he can do is draw and pass the turn back yet again. As you did mention, once Back to Basics was played, every spell that he plays is at a premium right now because he only gets one shot with the lands. It's an enormous cost. Two more coming across here for Burnett. Jitay is going to take up to four counters. We'll see if Michael does want to cast the brainstorm that he has picked up here. His he hand might, is so good, he might not even need to. Yeah, he might be in the reverse position of what Josh was doing earlier in the match, where the hand's just too good. Cho will draw a polluted delta. He will put that into play. You see the force of will in his hand. Bernat considering untapping, but it looks like he's going to cast a brainstorm here, maybe on the end step. Yeah, he will. So one, two, and three cards coming. Is that a misdirection he's picked up? That is a misdirection. Two copies of that in the sideboard. Yeah. Don't know. Uh, obviously, he hasn't. Cho hasn't seen that this game. Don't know if he's aware that this is a card that is in the Blue White Stoneforge decks. But we saw Cho fire off a him to Torex, so that could go. Uh, that could go poorly in the third game, which we're going to be moving here shortly. Abrupt decay as well. Yeah. Yeah, Michael's sideboard is a little bit interesting. You didn't mention those misdirections. We see back to basics. He's got a humility, a couple copies of Swan Song, a small Enlightened Tutor package as well. We'll go over all of that in detail once we do move to sideboarding here for game number three. You see Bernat's going to sacrifice Marsh Flats. Looks like he's going to cast a Jace the Mind Sculptor, and he does. That'll get a Force of Will, removing a Force of Will. 
And again, keep in mind, Cho cannot even hard cast a Force of Will in this spot because if he does, then back to basics is the full lock. Bernat's going to misdirect the Force of Will at misdirection. And so what this effectively does is a force of it, it's a force of will clone basically. Yeah, misdirection can be force of will against other counter spells by misdirecting the counter spell in question to misdirection. Yeah. And of course it can also be quite good against cards like Hidatorak, Lightning Bolt, Abrupt Decay, and so forth. It's a little bit of strange interaction, but that is the way that it works, and it's gonna get the job done. So Michael Burnett's going to tie this matchup up against Joshua Cho. Blue White Stone Blade and Bug Delver are moving to a third and final game. You do see the records for the players on the screen, seven, one, and one for Burnett, Cho seven and two. So obviously both these players are in the running here for top eight at our season one invitational. But we're gonna look at the sideboards here. You've got Cho's in front of you. How do you think he's uh, maybe re-sideboarding here for game three? Well, he has two copies of Spell Pierce and Abrupt Decay, a Disfigure, a Sylvan Library, a Crozan Grip, two Kogari Charms, a Force of Will, a Maelstrom Pulse, a Liliana the Veil, two Surgical Extractions, an Envelop, and a Vendillion Click. I think he certainly wants the Vendillion Click and the Liliana the Veil as there's just sort of generally good all-purpose cards in control matchups. If he didn't have it in the first game, I think it's reasonable for him to bring in Golgari Charm as he's now seen Supreme Verdict and Back to Basics. Golgari Charm, a very efficient answer to both those cards. I'm not sure if he wants the Crozan Grip as an answer to Equipment, also an answer to Back to Basics, so possibly reasonable to bring in as well. And I think he wants the additional Sylvan Library as well as it's just kind of a slow, grindier game and seeing extra cards is really valuable. So he has a lot of good action in his sideboard, but you know the threat of Back to Basics is really gonna contort his play. On the other side here for Burnett, you do mention Back to Basics. There are two of those, along with two copies of Misdirection, three Vendillion Clicks, an Enlightened Tutor, a Rest in Peace, two Flusterstorm, two Swan Song, Humility, and a Pippin Needle. And this is basically what Legacy sideboards do look like. Now, of course, two Back to Basics are in Burnett's deck. At least one Misdirection's in, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is two. You've got three Vendillion Clicks. You've got this small Enlightened Tutor package. I kind of like actually bringing in the Singleton Enlightened Tutor alongside those Back to Basics. Could see Rest in Peace come in here as well as the Bug Delver decks typically play Deathrite Shaman and Tarmogoyf, so Rest in Peace is rather good. And then you've got your Flush Storms and your Swan Songs. That's going to be Hate against Combo decks, the One Humility, which is good against the Show and Tell decks, and then kind of just the random one of Pith and Needle that can come along in with Enlightened Tutor. Yeah, I'm curious about Rest in Peace as well. I assume because Michael has three copies of Snapcaster Mage in his deck that it's more for dedicated combo graveyard decks like Dredge. We see a lot of decks like Blue White, Red Delver that don't care about their graveyard whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They bring in recipes against Tarmogoyf, Deathrite Shaman decks. But I, I would suspect Michael believes that just Snapcaster, Source of Plowshares is more powerful against Josh than Rest in Peacing away his graveyard. Uh, but it is possible he'll actually bring in the one Rest in Peace alongside Snapcaster Mage and just accept that sometimes it's going to be a little bit awkward, but he gets some pretty high upside in exchange. And the redundancy of Source of Plowshares in this matchup is actually really, really important. So Snapcaster plus Swords is a very useful tool for Renan to just kind of stymie the rush of Cho and then get the job done because he's the control deck in this matchup. Yeah, and if you want to know why some people still play Rug Delver instead of blue, white, red, or bug. A lot of it does have to do with Nimble Mongoose being untargetable. Mm -hmm. And when you're playing against Snapcaster Mage Swords to Plowshare, you can definitely feel all your creatures being targetable. Maybe even Blurred Mongoose could oh, make yeah. a comeback. Oh yeah, coming back for the first time. That's you, that's, <laughs> you, that's you right there. I, in fairness, I, two things about that. I thought Blurred Mongoose was okay for that tournament. And I have a lot of nostalgia for that card because it was in my first PTQ winning deck. So okay. anytime I can rationalize it to myself, Prophetic Bolt will be the same way. If I can ever play a Prophetic Bolt deck in, in Legacy, you're going to see me do it. I have, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. Oh, I, I understand. It's, <laughs> I'm not saying this is likely. That would be fair. I would like to see Prophetic Bolt come back. I'd also like to see someone activate a Goblin Trenches in Legacy, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Yeah. Trenches, Loam, Exploration, oh my Mana Bonds, goodness. make it happen. We have found it. Yeah. Is that, that most, <laughs> is that the most powerful thing you can do with that set of cards, is Goblin Trenches? No, probably not. But, but that's we, not what this is yeah, about. This, this is about. This is about putting two Goblins into play. Well, possibly even four or six. Oh, my goodness. We have broken it here at the show. It's going to play an Underground Sea and a Ponder. Time to look at three cards. See a couple of lands among them. Looks like Death Rite, a fetch land in an underground sea. Yeah. And Josh not happy with that, so it's time to shuffle up. If he was willing to shuffle away a Death Rite there when he had a shuffle land in his top three, very likely he has a land heavy hand. Let's see what the mystery card is here. If 
we can. Don't get a good look at it. Joe will just pass the turn back. Bernat will draw a card. You see a source of postures there. He also has a brainstorm. Going to play a martial arts. Pass the turn back. Cho will take a draw. Does have a copy of Hypnotoric in his hand. Got to be scared of misdirection, though, after what he saw last game. Trying to beat source to plowshares out of a basic land-heavy control deck for a deck like Bug Delver is a big challenge. I agree. One of your ways to steal games against decks like Esper is involving Wasteland, and, and Michael can play a game where he doesn't have to worry about that whatsoever. Show with a thought seize here as well. He's, he's got a lot of lines he can take here. He can brainstorm this turn or not, and he could either thought seize or him to Torak or potentially do something else. So even in the second turn, a lot of options. Just passing the turn back and they're playing Misty and Rainforest. Bernat's going to play a Flooded Strand. And here's a brainstorm on the end step. So three cards coming for Cho. He'll obviously be able to make it a perfect brainstorm with that Misty Rainforest, but he's got a lot of decisions to make. And, he, and you know, that's the great thing about Legacy is it, it, all these decisions happen in the first couple of turns of the game, and sequencing these spells is so very important. Yeah, this is what's awesome about getting to do coverage with Legacy as well, because when you're playing the format, you're often just watching your opponent do these things, and you don't get to see what the thought process is. But when both hands, players' hands are visible, you can actually see what's going on. Cho did brainstorm, and he chose not to fetch. So he drew a burden catacombs directly, put it directly into play, and now he's going to lead off his turn with a thoughts. You see a couple copies of him and Torak in his hand right now, and also a daze. So. Yeah, I think his plan here is to go crazy attacking Michael's hand, clearing out the one way he has to interact with him, and eventually landing an opening to resolve Liliana the Veil. So Thoughtseize is obviously going to make some action happen here. Burnett's going to start by sacrificing Misty Rainforest, likely to search up just a basic island, and maybe we'll see a Brainstorm here in a moment. Yeah, I imagine Brainstorm and hiding the two cards he's most concerned about. Josh taking with Thoughtseize is where Michael is going to start this. And there's a Brainstorm. Cho has a daze in his hand. I'm not sure if this is worth dazing or not, Patrick. Well, if he does daze it, it requires Michael to sacrifice his other fetch land. Yeah. So he loses the value of uh, shuffling away his worst two if he decides to go down that road. Yeah. And Cho could just be posturing here. Spell Pierce as well, but here's a brainstorm. Yeah, what's odd about why I don't like the daze play, why I like Josh not dazing here, is that Michael right now is compelled to put his two best cards on top of his deck yeah. because he's hiding them from Thoughtseize. So it's very low cost for Michael to say, okay, I'll shuffle with my Marsh Lads right now, still hide the best two, and Thoughtseize one of the inferior cards. So Brainstorm is going to resolve now. Here is the Thoughtseize. Take a look at the cards. You've got a Counterspell, there's a Misdirection. There's also a Spell Pierce, a Swords to Plowshares, a Jace, the Mind Sculptor, and a Supreme Verdict. And this is really obnoxious for, for Cho as he cannot create an opening for him to Torak with this hand as Michael has access to both Spell Pierce and Misdirection. And nor can he set up an opening for Liliana the Veil, as Michael has both Spell Pierce and Counter Spell for next turn. So this is a pretty bad hand for Josh C. And keep in mind, Michael hit his best two cards on top as yeah. well. Or at least two cards that he didn't feel he needed for this turn. I mean, I think Josh's turn, as he does write down these cards with Thoughtseize, I think he can just take the Misdirection with the Thoughtseize, fire off the Hymnotorak, daze the Spell Pierce, and just kind of hope for the best from there. Yep. I'm not sure if that's the best line of play, but I mean, that's what he can do. Yeah, I just don't know if his hand allows him a different, a different path. So yeah, Misdirection's going to go away. The fetch lines are going to get sacked, and that looks like the play that he's going to make. Yeah, this is not bad for, for Cho, but I believe he was anticipating seeing a more manageable hand for him to resolve these hymns through. The issue here, too, is that we assume that Burnett hid his two best cards. That's what we're thinking here. Yeah. And so Josh can fire him to and Branch just goes, that's fine. Like, doesn't sacrifice the, the flat to go get a Tundra and Spell Pierce it and walk into the day. So he's just like, okay. It's also possible that Michael respects the possibility of him to Torak as a follow-up enough that he kept the cards in his hand he needs to make sure he can fight over him. Yeah. Because this is a him directly into a Spell Pierce that Cho knows about. And so Bernat's thinking, okay, so he's hemming me. Is he trying to get me to fetch? away the cards? Did I fetch away? Like, does he think I put good cards on top or does he think I put bad cards on top? You know, I'm playing a back-to-basics deck. Cho's playing a deck that has Wasteland in it. Can I afford to get a Tundra in this situation? There's a lot of things to think about right now. Yeah, there's a lot of jockeying over spells in Legacy. 
Yeah, and I thought we might I thought we might see this. Where Vanette just says, okay, I have a spell pierce, but I don't care. That's fine. So there are six cards there, and he's gonna lose two of them. So that's one. And that's gonna be a reroll. And we're good to go. That's a three. Let's see what he lost. Counterspell and spell pierce. And that's really good for uh, for Cho as now he has a path open for Liliana the Veil. Yep. The scary thing here, obviously, is that Bernat refusing to shuffle. And there's a Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah. And sacrifice Marshall Lance. Michael in games two and three has shown an incredible amount of respect for Cho's potential out of soft counters there. You can see he was going through his head. All of Josh's lines of play pointed to days being in his hand. And instead of Michael taking the conventional route and saying, okay, uh, all right, I'll spell Pierce, and if he has days, which he probably does, I guess I'm just in a lot of trouble. He mm -hmm. says, okay, that's, I'm going to get him here. It's not good for me, but the alternative of walking into a days here is far worse. Yeah, the Stoneforge Mystic is going to resolve here. Bernat going to go a searching. He's going to get a battered skull. You see Cho's hand right now. He's got another him. He's got the Liliana, Tropical Island, and a days. So a pretty powerful hand here. For both players, honestly, as Batter Skull's added to the grip here for Bernat. Cho's going to untap. You see we're underneath 10 minutes on the clock. Pretty crucial match for both of these players with top eight aspirations. Cho is going to tap three mana and deploy the Black Planeswalker. I'm going to tick it down to take care of the Stoneforge Mystic. That's going to go away. Cho will pass the turn back. And if Josh could really go to work on Michael's hand, then any threat he top decks could potentially carry the day. Absolutely. As now... Pluto Delta is going to get sacrificed for Bernat. He's going to get a Tundra. Let's see what his spell is going to be. You see, Cho picked up a Vendillion Click on his turn. And Click is, is really excellent for, for Cho here. Three mana, turn a Nemesis. I do not think so. There's a daze. Huge daze there from Cho. Pass the turn back. Cho will take a draw. Pretty intriguing to see Michael do that when he showed so much respect for days on the previous turn. This could be a situation where he just wants that card to get dazed. Yep. He may be playing towards something like Jace the Mind Sculptor. Mm -hmm. Cho considered playing Cho considered playing his underground C there, but instead didn't just yet because he knows he's gonna take up Liliana. So it's going to be time here. <laughs> As you see, he's going to have to reroll quite a bit to get these two cards. He's, he, does he ever lose a die roll when they're deciding who's <laughs> going to go first? Because that's a bunch of sixes. Now he's going to do this here. So there's another six. Man, he's good at sixes. I want to play craps with him. There goes the swords, and there goes a Jace. So now yeah. Lilia's going to tick up, and Cho's got the land of discard, obviously. Right, so I think his plan here is just to basically get these players both down to very few resources, but have a Liliana and a Vendillion click yeah, left over. That's where Liliana's at its best, grinding away the resources. There's a Marsh Flash past the turn back. Cho has really done a nice job of sequencing this game. Now he picks up a Brainstorm as well. Just very sharp play. Yeah. All the sequencing, the patience, knowing exactly when to move. The day is countering something very, very relevant. Now he's going to take his time on this turn, but that's part of the reason for that is because he picked up a brainstorm. I think the other thing he's weighing to the equation is if I tick Liliana up, I'm probably going to have to let go of this spell pierce. And is that okay with me? Because Michael has shown that he's got cards that cost a lot of mana that are worth spell piercing. But we're going to start with a brainstorm. Yeah, and again, the, the one thing that really... As far ahead as Josh is right now, he still has to be mindful of back to basics. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the card here that can still steal this game for Michael if Josh gets sloppy. Josh going to figure out what cards to put back with this brainstorm. Picked up a Deathrite Shaman along with a Wasteland, I believe another land. Does put two cards back. Going to tick up Liliana. There goes the Underground Sea. There's a Deathrite Shaman. Has Spell Pierce as his last card. Passes it back to Burnett. Bernat going to draw his card. He just has to pass the turn back with one card in his hand every single turn. Liliana going to get to work here. Let's see if Cho... Maybe going to just pass the turn back. Not exactly sure. I think he may be passing the turn back with no intentions of ticking up Liliana because his hand, too, his hand is too good. Well, and also that, you know, Michael knows that Liliana is in play, so what's in the... You know, he's not slow rolling something, you may have something reactive. Yeah, that's exactly what we just saw. He just, he chose not to use Liliana. Now he's going to play Vendillion Click on Bernat's end step. 
This is the clock. Although this is a little rough with Michael having two cards in hand. I mean, this could easily this click could easily be running into something like Snapcaster for counter spell, or just oh. some other permission spell. There's the swords. That'll get it done. Not great for Josh, but that certainly could have been a lot worse. Yeah, and Force Will is the last card, and Josh says you can definitely keep that as Cho's going to untap. He'll take a draw here. There's a Wasteland. That can fire off on the Tundra, and then it is. He still refuses to take Liliana up. He's really valuing that Spell Pierce highly. Well, he also just doesn't respect Michael's Force of Will. That's the other part of this. I think when he draws something poor, he'll throw it away, but... Force of Will is, is not very good for Michael here right now as Josh has all he needs to win the game in play. And uh, furthermore, you know, the Force of Will is not very good when Josh is attacking Michael's hand with Liliana the Veil. Mm -hmm. That's going to go removing here. Better to target Michael's graveyard because he's a Snapcaster mage deck because now Liliana can take up as Cho has drawn something that is obviously not very useful. Bernat's ready to discard. Cho discards a polluted Delta. Bernat discards that Force of Will that Cho knew about. Passed the turn back. Death right at the ready. This is a Snapcaster Mage, maybe. Oh, this is not going to be good for Michael. No, and it's not a Snapcaster Mage. Hello, Deathrite Shaman. I think Cho is wondering if he's, if he's forced to cast that as he may have announced the spell. Well, they're snappy. There's, she's going to target Swords of Plowshares, and Cho's going to eat that alive. So there that goes. Bernat's going to go down to 13. Bernat's going to untap. He's going to take a draw here, see what he finds. See, Snappy's probably going to get into Liliana. You would imagine. I mean, it forces Joss to actually produce some sort of answer or edict with a Liliana, and then it's out of play. Brainstorm here from Bernat. He has no cards in his hand, so he's going to have to put two back. He gets to keep one, and then he gets to fetch away with Marsh Flats. So it's not a bad brainstorm, and then Marsh Flats can't search up a Plains or a Tundra. But Michael's just being squeezed on so many angles Oh, here. yeah. This, and this is exactly the kind of game that Cho wants to get into, where a lot of discard. Now Liliana gets to do what Liliana does, which is really just clean up a grindy game. It's, yeah, it's very challenging for Josh to just win with a curve of beat down creatures. It can happen in some games, but Michael's deck with Swords of Plash, Hair, Snapcaster Mage, and Supreme Verdict is pretty well suited to fight that kind of fight. Sure. But the Hypnotorak into Liliana type of game is much harder. Joe sure, with the thoughts, he's there to get the Spell Pierce out of the hand. Going to remove the Liliana. That's going to take care of Snapcaster Mage. Bernat's going to sacrifice the Marsh Flats to clear the top two cards and get a land out of his deck. We'll see if it's going to be a Plains or a Tundra here. It's going to be a Tundra. And again, you see the board position right now. Bernat, no cards in his hand, three lands in play. Cho, three lands in play, a Deathrite Shaman, and just a Spell Pierce in his hand that he's been clutching for some time now. Bernat's going to draw a card. He passes the turn back. Cho going to remove something from the graveyard. Going to untap. He'll take a draw. This is a Delver of Secrets. There's a clock. Pass the turn back. And that Delver is actually a really important draw for Josh here, as the way the pacing of the game was going, Michael still had some live draws, including Stoneforge, Mystic, and True Name Nemesis. Still were, were pretty productive in this spot. The game's now gotten a lot harder. Bernat's going to sacrifice the land. He's going to go get an island. This might be a Jace the Mind Sculptor. This is Supreme Verdict. I mean, we've got a game. We've got a real game if this is Supreme Verdict. There's four mana. That is a Jace. For Michael, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. There's yeah. a spell pierce, and then an activation of death. Right, Shaman Cho really picking up the pace now. As we are underneath a minute in the match, he's going to play a wasteland. That's going to take care of the tundra. That's going to lock out Supreme Verdict as a draw. And even though Delver didn't flip, Cho's got a pretty nice clock right now. Yeah. I mean, we're talking. We're looking at one turn of this Delver flips. Bernat draws. He's going to put his island into play. Cho's going to remove a card with death. Right, Shaman. Bernat's going to go down to four. Cho going to take a look at the top card of his deck. That is a daze. That's going to flip the Insectile Aberration in for three. Going to put Bernat down to one. Deathrite activation, and that is going to do it. Joshua Cho is going to win this match over Michael Bernat. Two games to one. Cho moves on to eight and two. Bernat down to seven, two and one. Bug Delver picks up a win over Blue White Stoneblade. You can see frustration on one player's side, happiness on the other. But when a tight match like that happens, the Invitational, it's no surprise. Yeah, it's not, it's not a, 
clear if Michael is disappointed with the way the match went, if he was a little upset with Josh for forcing him to that Snapcaster Mage mm -hmm. play, but Michael clearly a little bit disappointed here. 